I don't know about you, but I think we're going to have a little bit of church today. Amen. That right there make a Lutheran shout. Amen. Bobby, I didn't know you was a Lutheran, but praise God. He's going to shout anyway. <laughs> Woo. Hey. I'm going to tell you what. How many of you are looking forward to that day? Whether he comes or whether we go, we're going to be with him. And he will redeem every. Every ounce of creation will be accounted as settled. It will be settled on the cross or it will be settled in his judgment. Nothing will be left unfinished. And the king is coming. So we as God's people, we have work to do until he comes. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. We're going to finish chapter 3 today. I want to encourage you to come Wednesday evening. We've been dealing with Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And I have been working for about two months on a diagram of all of God's covenants. Starting with the covenant with Adam in the garden, through the covenant with Noah, through the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, and finally the covenant with God's people who was accomplished in Christ, that's the new covenant, the covenant of grace. I've been working on a diagram for two months, and so I want to, if not fully explain it, give the ones who have been coming regularly on Wednesday nights to go ahead and introduce that to you. And I think it's going to be very, very helpful. I look forward to seeing you there. Wednesday, we also have children's choir as well. If you're in Mark chapter 3, say word. We're going to be focusing on verse 31 through the end of the chapter. This is God's word. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside the house, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are looking for you. Answering them, Jesus said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, you are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, is my brother and sister and mother. May God bless the reading of his word today. How many of you, when you grew up, and your mother and father told you to do something, and then you said, why? How many of them told you, don't worry about why, just do it? Anybody? I tell my kids all the time, Bella, go do this. Why? Bella, you're not old enough to ask why. Right now, you're old enough to do it. Just do it. Son, I need you to eat three more bites of your food. Why? Honestly, so your mother doesn't get mad at me, son. But because it's going to help you live, it's going to help you grow strong. We expected them to do it. Well, here we find a different perspective on Jesus, who is now a grown man and who is calling disciples to follow him. But the problem is his family still saw carpenter Jesus. They didn't see Messiah Jesus. Amen? 
You see, if you remember our message from two weeks ago, once these massive, massive crowds started following Jesus, matter of fact, his, his family said that Jesus is out of his mind. If you look to, uh, let's see, someone find it for me. Oh, oh, if you look to verse 22, it says, When his own family heard of this, they went to take custody of Jesus, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. They didn't understand that carpenter Jesus was calling people to follow him as Messiah Jesus. And so now we have this setting where there's so many people crowded in this house that Jesus and his disciples can't even eat. They can't even have supper. They can't even rest. And his family hears about this, and so what we have in verse 31 is they're trying to uh, uh, go and, and, and pull Jesus away from this paparazzi following that has gathered around him. But Jesus was not interested in the instructions of his family. He was interested in the instructions of his heavenly father. The title today is The New Covenant Family of God. Throughout the Old Testament, the family took priority in Hebrew life, took priority and precedence over the neighboring tribes of the Gentiles. Matter of fact, if you were a Hebrew, you were forbidden from doing business with the Gentile. You couldn't even eat with the Gentiles. So what you did is you always ate with your family. How many of you guys grew up eating at the dinner table with your family? That's a lost art. It's a lost tradition in today's world. So many people eat in front of the TV or eat in front of the iPhone. Or We have a rule in my house that when we're at the dinner table, phones go away. Priority, uh, basically, Tyler made me keep that rule. But that's the rule. At the dinner table, no phones. Family's important. It was important in Hebrew culture. And what we find throughout the Old Testament is that the Old Covenant was passed through physical birth. And the sign of the covenant was circumcision. So the way you were grafted in the Old Covenant was by being born into a Hebrew family. And and no one asked the seven-day-old, eight-day-old little baby, hey, do you want to be a Hebrew or not? No, those little boys were circumcised on the eighth day. They were born into the old covenant, not by choice, but by birth. And once you were born into the family, you were expected to follow the covenant of God's people that God had gave them, not only through Abraham, but through Sinai. As I mentioned, the Hebrew family was tightly knit Together, your family was important to you because your family passed down your heritage. I heard this article that uh, this New York Times article said a father gave birth to a son. Now, it doesn't take a genius to know that fathers can't give birth. So what we have is a self-identified male who's actually a female who identifies as a male gave birth through natural means. Like God planned it that way. Females give birth. Men can't. But on the birth certificate, there's no option on the birth certificate for father and father. Did you know that? In New York State, it says mother and father. Because in order for you to trace your lineage, you have to know who your father's side is and who your mother's side is. If you're looking for your father's side and your father's side, it mixes things all up. Your family is important to you because uh, uh, my mother's side, my mother was a McLean and her mother was a church. So I've went on Ancestry.com. I've researched the McLean side. I've researched the church side. I know my father's side. I've researched the Watkins side. All of those are part of my heritage, a little bit of Scotch-Irish All of those are part of who I am. But what we see in the New Testament is that the new covenant is not passed through the family. 
Rather, it's passed through the Holy Spirit. You're no longer born by physical birth into the new covenant. You're born by spiritual birth. So what we see in this closing section of Mark chapter 3 is a distinction between the physical family, which lasts temporarily, and the eternal family, which lasts forever. Folks, I want you to look to your neighbor, to your left, and to your right. All right? You're going to see them for a long time. If you don't like them, better figure it out now. And some of you, that's a problem because you're sitting beside your husband and your wife. At least learn to like them here. Okay? If you're taking notes with us in your bulletin, the first thing that we want to notice in the text is that the family of God is born through the Spirit of God. What we have preceding this chapter that we covered previously is seeing those who reject the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 29 that whoever blasphemes against the Spirit never has forgiveness. So if you reject the Spirit of God, you will not have forgiveness. But if the Spirit of God works upon your heart, you will have forgiveness. So the family of God comes through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is who births us into the new family. There's that famous story of a wise person asking Jesus, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And they said, how can I enter again into my mother's womb? And everyone probably laughed about it. But Jesus is not talking about a physical family. He's talking about a spiritual family. You must be born again. You must be birthed into a new creature. You must have a new identity. You must have a new defining mark about your life, and that is the Spirit of Christ taking over you. Those who reject the Spirit never have forgiveness, but those who are in the family of God have forgiveness of sin. Here is what makes you in the family of God. Are your sins forgiven or are they not? See, some people don't want forgiveness of sins because they don't think they need it. They don't think they've don't done anything wrong. If you don't think you need forgiveness, you're not in the family of God. Book of 1 John says, if anyone claims that he has no sin, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Anyone claims that they are sinless does not see their need for Christ and does not see that they are in the family of God. But those who know they need forgiveness are the ones who belong to the family of God because we know we need Christ. We know, do you, need, do you know you need Christ today? Listen, I didn't just need Christ when I was saved. I need him today, and I'm going to need him tomorrow, and I'm going to need him on Tuesday as well. You know why? Because I know that I mess up every day, and I need a mediator tomorrow, not just when I asked him to forgive me. I need a mediator every day who makes intercession before the Father. We have an advocate, the great high priest, who stands on our behalf. For the family of God. You see, Jesus does not intercede for people who don't believe. Those who are rejected. Those who reject the Holy Spirit. There is no intercession for them. There is no mediator for them. Because Romans chapter 2 and 1 says the wrath of God abides upon them. They're storing up wrath for the day of judgment. When His holy judgment will be revealed against all people. And unless we're in the family of God, we will face that judgment. But if we're in God's family, oh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We have a protector. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, I put this in your notes. It says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You see, carnal people cannot discern the things of God because they can only be discerned through the Spirit of God. That means it's the Spirit of God which brings illumination. The Spirit of God brings illumination to our heart. I was listening to John Piper when I mowed grass. I put my headphones in and listened to John Piper, and he said, It's not just reading the Scripture which brings life, but it's the illumination of the Holy Spirit by the Scripture which brings life. See, an atheist can read Scripture and not have life if they don't believe. 
But we have life because the Holy Spirit carries God's word and buries it deep within our heart. That's why it's the, the word of life, sharper than any sword that cuts down through marrow. Jesus' physical family had no covenant benefit to Christ. See, what we have here is a distinction between how his family could demand from him as a son and what they must receive from him as a savior. You see, if you're not gathered at the Lord's feet, you don't eat at the Lord's table. You can stand outside of the house and demand things from God, but unless you're at his feet, seeing him for who he is, there is no morsels on the table for you. There's some people that try to participate in the blessings of Christ. They want Christ to do things for him, but yet they never gather at his feet. But when we gather at his feet, we see him for who he is, and it's not that we want our will, it's that He becomes our will. And what we want is Him. That brings me to my second point. The family of God are the disciples of the Son of God. We see in verse 32 that a crowd was sitting around Him. They were following Him. They were listening to Him. They were hearing Him. I can maybe imagine that some of them bought their new iPad papyri in there and jotted down things that Jesus was saying. Somehow it happened because they recorded all these things later. You know, they had the papyri 7.0. Unlimited text messaging. And I can imagine them sitting at Jesus' feet, writing down His teachings and they were gleaning from everything that he was offering to them and there are those who follow him and listen to him but there are those who stand outside the house that demand from him my daughter's nine years old going on 25 she'll tell me to do something be working out in the yard she said daddy you need to put your gas can up Say, sweetie, don't tell me what to do. Or I'll be in the living room playing with something and playing with Roman and Bella say, Daddy, you need to you need to clean up what you and Roman played with. Say, Bella, don't tell me what to do. It's funny because man, Bella is little general. She is general, and, and, and Roman and Mayor, they line up, and they march in file. But I, I have to explain to her, you can't tell your parents what to do. Same thing for Jesus. You don't get to tell Jesus what to do. We don't get to tell Jesus what he must do. He tells us what we must do. And some people think that because Jesus is now their Lord, that they can ask anything from Him, and He'll do whatever they want. But we must ask according to His name, according to what glorifies Him, according to what brings delight to Him. And when God is our highest delight, then what we ask in his name is what will bring him glory. I can't just ask God and say, God, I want a Jeep Wrangler on 35 inch tires. I can't just do that. But I can say, God, help me to glorify your name among all peoples. The first one is my one, my will. The second one is his will. And he will help us accomplish his will. In this depiction, Jesus' family is outside the house, but the disciples are inside the house. Normally what we would think is that your family would be with you and the crowd would be outside, but this is reversed. We see an increased priority on spiritual family and a decreased priority on physical family. And I'm not saying that we should neglect our physical family. But I am saying that Jesus establishes a pattern for his disciples that physical family 
should not impede the work of spiritual family. Let me say that again. Physical family should not impede the work of spiritual family. The physical family is temporary, but the spiritual family is eternal. Some people get it backwards. Some people think that heaven is going to be an extension of your physical family. I've heard some people say when a loved one dies that daddy's up in heaven waiting to be reunited with mama. And that's a failure to understand the joy of heaven, which is Christ alone. The joy of heaven is Christ. The joy of heaven is not physical family. When we get to heaven, we're not looking forward to the physical relationship defining our eternity. We're looking forward to the spiritual relationship defining our eternity. It's like that song. They sang, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, when I see fullness of his grace, it's him that we're looking for. And it's through the shed blood of Christ that we're united to Christ. The heavenly kingdom is not defined by earthly covenant, but it's defined by spiritual, eternal covenant. I think this is in your notes, Luke 14, 26. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus says, I better be the most important thing in your life or you can't follow me at all. And that's the truth. Whatever you desire most is what you worship. Whatever you enjoy most is what your God is. Whatever you prize and satisfy uh, satisfies you most is your treasure and your delight. And the question is, is that Christ or is it something else? Because I'm going to give you a word right now. Your treasure and your joy and your satisfaction is not and is not supposed to be wrapped up in a spouse. Because whether you're married or not married, your treasure is in God. And whoever God brings along is something that helps you along the path of that treasure. But that person never becomes the treasure. I wish someone would help me out today. See, throughout chapter 3, Jesus calls the crowds to follow him. But his family seeks Jesus to call Jesus to them. So there's a dichotomy. Jesus is calling the crowds, but his family is still calling Jesus. You cannot monopolize Jesus. You cannot constrain Jesus from his mission. You cannot tell Jesus, who said he's saving a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, that that's not what you're supposed to do. John Piper said, There's three types of Christians, the goers, the senders, and the disobedient. All right, if you can't go on mission, you send somebody on mission. Maybe God's raised you up as a a wealthy business owner, and you need to send some people to Haiti or Chicago or to wherever God's going to open the door. Maybe that's your calling in life. But there's some other people that are called to be sent. Either way, his mission is this is what we're going to do. You can't say, no, I'm not going to do that. I had a person tell me one time, says, I don't believe in missions. I think it's just a chance for y'all to uh, get away on a little trip. Have you been to Haiti? Miss Alta, can we testify something? When you go to Haiti, it's not vacation. Amen? I got to just, just talk to you right for a minute. First time I went to Haiti, I went to Pastor Prodeu's house. I said, to, where's the bathroom? He took me in the backyard to this concrete block house. And in the backyard, there was a hole in the concrete. He says, here you go. What in vacation? First time me and Pastor Robert went down there. Pastor Robert was going around the market. And in Haitian, you say, bonjour, which means hello. Pastor Robert was going around the market saying, Bon qui? Bon qui? And I think it means good bowl. Like, what is, what is qui? Good bowl? So he was seeing the people in the market with like rice and 
beans and plantains and, and everything in these bowls. And he's going around saying, nice bowl. Nice bowl. No wonder they make fun of Americans. But listen, God's mission is that you are on mission. Whether you live here in Concord, we should be telling people about Christ. Or whether he sends you to every tribe, tongue, and nation, you should be telling people about Christ. That's his mission. Lastly, the family of God are those who do the will of God. Jesus says in verse 34, when he looks at those seated around him, he says, Here are my brother and my mother. Whoever does God's will is my brothers and sister and mother. A Christian is marked by their desire for God and for his will. The mark of a Christian is the desire for God and the desire to accomplish his will and his mission. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, then there is a desire for God. If there's no desire for God, there's no Holy Spirit. So what is God's will? God's will, John 6, 40 says, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up. God's will is that in our life we're looking to the Son every day. That we're not looking to the world to satisfy us. We're not looking to other people to satisfy us. We're not looking to, to uh, uh, finances or success to satisfy us, but we're looking to the Son to have life. Are you looking to the sun each day for your life? Are you looking to the sun each day for your joy? Are you looking to the sun each day for your peace? If the answer is no, then what evidence do you have that you are a Christian? There's a lot of people who think they're a Christian because their mom was a Christian or their dad was a Christian. Over in England, there's still something like 70% of people who claim Christianity and somewhere around 10% of the population goes to a church, to a Christian church. What defines Christianity? It's not just something that's passed down from your family. It's not a name. I'm a Watkins. My dad was a Watkins. But Christianity is not because someone passed it down to me, but because the Holy Spirit birthed it in my heart. If you died today and you do not look to God for your salvation, you will perish. So we must implore you to look to Christ today. Gather around Him at His feet and look to Him. Give not rest to your eyes or your heart until you answer the question of, is your desire fulfilled in God? That's Christianity. That God is our supreme joy. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to go through this life and not have bad days. I certainly have bad days all along. But what I see is that God's sovereignty in the bad days means I'm pointed to Him even more. Because the days don't fulfill me. The relationships don't fulfill me. But only God brings that joy. When we are saved, we will want to do the will of God. We will want to take Christ to the nations. Charles Spurgeon said, if you have no desire for others to be saved, you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. If we don't desire to fulfill God's promises, then we don't desire God. But when we do desire God, we desire His will to be accomplished. What I want us to understand in conclusion is that it's not our works that cause us to be in His family. We're not in His family because our works placed us there. Because the things we do for God placed us there. Rather, it is the placement in his family which is the cause for the good works. So you can spend your life building churches and hospitals and, 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 and houses for children. But good deeds do not get you into the family of God. There's people who do that and have no concern for God. Well, what gets you into the family of God is do you look to the Son in belief? Can you look to the Son and still want your own will? Can you see the spotless Lamb who died in your place and reject His commands? Because if you do see Him, you will cherish Him because He is the joy of life and heaven. Friends, we're going to ask you this today. 
Are you in the family of God? If the answer is no, let's change that today. Let's see the Spirit of God bringing that knowledge to your heart that He is not your desire. And cry out to Him. Cry out to Him for salvation. He will save you today. He will place you into His family today. Let's pray. Lord, if there's anyone here under the sound of Your Word being preached this morning that does not know You as Lord and Savior, that does not believe in You as their only...